Well, brethren, we are in the final stages of this world's society. Most of you realize that, and we know that things are happening very rapidly, and this world is coming to an end. That is the world society. You know, when the God talks about this world, off of the term used as cosmos, that is the cosmopolitan society of the world, not the earth, but the society that Satan has created in this earth. I have before me here an article out of the Wall Street Journal just yesterday. Gay marriage passes in New Jersey, but veto looms. The New Jersey legislature on Thursday sent a bill legalizing same-sex marriage to Governor Chris Christie, who said he would veto it, but they're showing, of course, it may be overridden eventually. In Maryland, the House of Delegates began debate Thursday on legislation that would allow for the same-sex nuptials. And then they say here later, Illinois also introduced it in the assembly last week. Seven states and Washington, D.C. now allow gay marriage. The state of Washington was the latest to allow it. So if they get it through in New Jersey and Maryland and elsewhere, of course, then they'll get up to 10 or 12 states pretty quickly, and it will probably start to sweep across the country. Men marrying men, so-called marrying, and women marrying women. Well, as Mr. Lyons said, man is trying to make respectable somehow every abomination that God Almighty has condemned. And it really is awful. And when these things happen, God is looking down. And you remember back in Ezekiel chapter 9 about those who sigh and cry for the abominations of Israel. And that's what's happening right here, right now. And we should be very sorry in one sense. In another sense, we can rejoice because we can lift up our heads knowing that our redemption is soon. The worse these things get, the closer it is to the coming of Jesus Christ to stop it. At some point, God will say, enough, and he will intervene. We know that, and we see world events moving in that direction. Brethren, we see that there is an imminent Israeli attack on, on Iran and, of course, we don't know that, but that's what a lot of world analysts have indicated. Even our defense secretary, Panada, has indicated that. Leon Panetta, I should say. And one of the best world news analysts, Charles Krauthammer, has said he's sure it's going to take place in April, May, April, May, or June. So that would be coming up in two or three months if that is the case. Most analysts feel they've got to do that to survive. Otherwise, they're under the threat of being literally annihilated by the Iranians if the Iranians get the atomic bomb. If this happens, or when it happens, it will speed up the coming together of the Arab nations and create what the Bible calls the king of the south. It will cause oil prices to skyrocket, and that will affect the American economy very powerfully and probably throw us into an inflationary situation and affect all of our lives, all of our lives. Also, it will shake the, the European Union very, very much and would cause them, no doubt, to begin to come together to stop all this stuff a lot faster and bring about the beast power more quickly so things can start to be triggered in world events yet this spring. We don't know and know that we know that's going to happen, but that very probably could happen, and we're certainly going to look forward and ask God to intervene and bring Christ back to this earth soon as King of Kings. Many other prophetic events we've talked about are heating up, major things. Most of you've read in the newspaper because it's been in newspapers all over, including our local paper, the Charlotte Observer. It's been in the Wall Street Journal two or three times, other papers. The fact that the Argentinians are now rioting in Buenos Aires and in uh, Bahia Blanca and causing all kinds of trouble about getting back the Falkland Islands that the British control and have controlled for over 100 years. Why are they doing that now? Well, because the oil has been discovered near there, and they want that oil. They're not trying to serve the people of the Falkland Islands. The people of the Falkland Islands are mainly British descended, and they have been voting for voting every time it comes up. They want to remain British, but the Argentinians want that oil. 
And so on the occasion of Prince William being sent there as part of the Royal Air Force or Navy, he's being sent there for a short deployment. They're using that, of course, as an excuse to riot and try to get back the Falkland Islands or get it back. They never really officially had it. But at any rate, Britain will no doubt lose that other Seagate. Then there will be one, as I've said. The only one left then would be Gibraltar, and Spain is agitating to get that back. These things are moving. A lot of these things I'm talking about may be actually done within the next year or so. So it's important that we realize major prophetic events are getting very close. We all need to understand, brethren, that one-fourth of this Bible, the Word of God, is devoted to prophecy. And all of you here and all of you brethren around the world who may be seeing this need to understand this one-fourth of the Bible better. A lot of our brethren sort of halfway understand it, but you may not be able to fully prove it to yourself. You may have doubts later on, as we found thousands and tens of thousands of our dear brethren, even people that I knew and taught and I thought they understood, jumped the track because they never fully proved to themselves they should keep God's law. They never fully proved to themselves our national identity. They never fully proved to themselves these prophecies, and they jumped the track. I hope none of you will jump the track. Prophecy is one of the great proofs of God. The Creator God inspired specific prophecies affecting major nations, major sea gates around the world as well, and other things, and these prophecies are happening just as the Creator said, and it's good for us to really understand them so you can prove them to others. Can you prove some of these things that I'm going to be talking about? I want you to ask yourself that question, and that may help you to listen better and learn a little better from this sermon today. So we all need to understand prophecy better. Almighty God said through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in Luke 4, verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And one-fourth of the word of God is prophecy. You have to live by it in the sense of understanding it and reacting to it and crying out for God to intervene, crying out for God to protect His people and various things that you need to do that involve understanding Bible prophecy. And it is very important to understand that part of the Bible. We also know in Luke 21, 36, Luke 21, 36, we often quote, Jesus said near the end of His Olivet Prophecy, watch and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So every one of us needs to be watching and praying and asking God to intervene, asking God to protect His people, to give His true people understanding and zeal and the real love of God so they will obey God and be protected. Very important. I want to cover the highlights today, just the highlights of one of the most exciting and powerful major prophecies in the Bible. I'm not going to read every word. I'd be here till midnight or even after midnight. And some of you Laodiceans out there might not want me to do that. I'm kidding, but most of you get very tired, and I would get very tired too. But anyway, I'm going to cover some of the highlights of Ezekiel, the prophet of Ezekiel as it pertains to us. So this is Ezekiel's message to you. Remember, brethren, one of the key points to understand prophecy, and Mr. Armstrong mentioned this over and over and over again, the understanding of our national identity, that is the national identity of the British descended and American peoples is a key, one of the most important keys to understanding end time Bible prophecy. If you don't understand that, you won't get it. There are very fine men, and I'm sure they mean well, like Billy Graham and Oral Roberts used to preach prophecy, and uh, different ones more recently like Pat Robertson and, uh, and different ones like that come along and preach prophecy, John Hagee, and they all have bits and pieces of it, but they don't understand it. They think that the return of Israel that is, of the Jews, I should say, some of the Jews, to Israel in 1948 was that great regathering of Israel at the time of the end. 
It was no such thing at all. It was just a partial kind of symbolic pre-configuration of what was going to happen later. It was not the fulfillment of that at all. And I'll show you that as we go through some of that, if we have time to get to that part of it right here. That is not true. They don't understand. Why don't they understand that? All these great so-called Protestant leaders who talk about prophecy, because they reject the understanding of the identity of Israel. They don't know who we are as a nation. They don't know who the British people are as a people. That is the, the Anglo-Saxon Celtic peoples of the British Isles of Canada, of Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. They don't get it. Therefore, they don't get the understanding of these prophecies. So we do need to understand that basic thing. Another thing is you need to understand the dates involved. And as you look at the book of Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they were contemporaneous pretty much. That means they left at the, lived at the same time. And as I look on my book and I've researched this and many of our prophetic uh, experts in the past using a course, and many of the outside experts agree with this too, but uh, uh, Dr. Herman Hay and others uh, put some of these things together and came to realize that the book of Ezekiel was written about 593, if you're taking notes from about 593 until 571 B.C. Now, when did ancient Israel go into captivity? About 721 to 718 B.C., over a three-year period, a three-year siege. How much earlier was that? Well, from 720 to 590, just using rough here, out, the round numbers, is about 30 years. So Israel went into captivity, the house of Israel, about 30 years before this prophecy was written. So when Ezekiel talks about something that's going to happen to the house of Israel, is he talking about something that happened 30 years ago? They think he was nuts. What if I talk to you? or Mr. Ames, or Dr. O'Neill, or any of us preaching here in Charlotte, and said, well, brethren, there's going to be a, uh, I don't know what we'd go back, going back 30, 30 years, uh, there's going to be a big uh, problem happen in Europe, and the Eastern European nations are going to break away from Russia, and the, uh, the, uh, the Berlin Wall is going to come down. It's going to come down. How exciting. You'd say, wow, that happened back in 1989 and 1990, over 30 years ago. What are you talking about? How can you call that prophecy? That's already happened. Do you see what I mean? So when Ezekiel's writing about something happening in the future that happened 30 years ago, or in some cases, you know, uh, then it would be ridiculous. He's writing after that time. And so he's talking about a yet future captivity on the peoples of Israel and the peoples of Judah as well. So it's important to understand that he's writing during the captivity of Judah. And Jeremiah was written about the same time, and they refer to each other occasionally in these books. And they were both inspired by God. And Jesus Christ referred to Ezekiel. He referred to Jeremiah, some of the statements there in the New Testament, as the Word of God. So they are part of the inspired Bible that we're to understand. So we need to get that background and understand that. I want to give you then the, prophet of the part of this prophecy that applies to you. Let's open your Bibles and please follow me this time. All of you, if you have a Bible, you can take some notes. But the main thing, you might take a few notes, but just follow in the book itself so you really get it. And remember, I do not have time to read all the book of Ezekiel. You'd be here till midnight, but I'll try to cover the highlights. Ezekiel 1. Now it came to pass in the 30th year of the fourth month, he was by the river Kibar or Kabur. The heavens were open, and he saw visions of God. It was in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. That's how they can date it. They can date it from about 593 to 571 B.C. because of these comments that are mentioned here. The word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest. God often uses hound, uh, bulldogs to do what bulldogs do and greyhounds to do what greyhounds do and so on. He uses the Jews 
to do what the Jews should do. He uses Levites to do what Levites should do. So Ezekiel here was a Levite. He was a priest. And God was speaking through him and writing this book. Jeremiah was also a Levite. Samuel was a Levite. Many of the great men of the Old Testament were Levites, and God was using them. Then this full first chapter is involved, brethren, describing, as you'll see, just came over it. We don't have time to read it. It's wonderful. Learn to study it carefully yourself as I've done. I've got it all marked up. It's describing the glory of God. As Mr. Lyons was indicating, and he didn't have five hours to go into all of this, but one reason they were punished for touching the ark is that ark represented the, the very heaven itself. It represented the very presence of God. And God said, don't touch it. Don't look inside it. Stay away. They had to have it that time, and God was trying to teach them the awe of the great Creator, and they had lost that awe. They were beginning to cheap God, treat God cheaply, so God allowed that to happen. If, if you did not understand the great white throne judgment, you would say, what a terrible thing. God just wiped us out. He was just a carnal man. He didn't know what he was doing. He was presumptuous. And many Jews have given up on God, millions of them, frankly, because they say, where was God during the Holocaust? You think about it. If you can point back to hundreds or thousands of your relatives being wiped out like that, it's awful. Where was God when the Lusitania sank? Where was God when the Titanic sank? Some of the old Hollywood movies, and I understand it's based on history, at least I think it was not the Titanic, maybe it was the Lusitania, this other big ocean liner that was sunk, in this case by, I think, a German U-boat, and they had the instance where a Protestant minister a Catholic priest and a Jewish rabbi all locked arms, and they let the women and the children get on the lifeboats, and they all just prayed and drowned together. Well, that's good. They meant well. All these worldly ministers don't mean evil. They just grow up and go into the religion of their parents. They don't know anything. They're blind. They all went down with the ship. Where was God? Where was God? Well, God is letting this world go its own way for 6,000 years and try out their idea of religion, their idea of an educational system, their idea of the political systems and voting and politicking and fighting and warring and so on. And after 6,000 years, he will intervene, and then we will have the millennium, and Christ will come, and then the world will be full, as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the ocean beds are full of water. But until that time, as you know, the Bible says over and over, Satan the devil, the old serpent who has deceived the whole world, Revelation 12, verse 9. Satan the devil has deceived the whole world, not part of the world. They don't get it. Therefore, God lets them go their own way, and some of these tragedies happen. So if you don't understand the doctrine of the great white throne judgment, that all those people on the Lusitania, probably every one of them, probably everyone on the Titanic, nearly everyone, perhaps every single one in the Hitler's ovens, in the Holocaust, they're going to be brought right back up again. From God's point of view, he'll just say to the angel, uh, press file 13, and they'll pop up again, and then they'll be given their first genuine opportunity to know the God of creation. They'll have a chance, not a second chance, their first chance to understand. So God is not unjust. He's allowing that. But he shows the glory of God, and we must not cheat, treat God's glory cheaply, brethren, when God tells us to honor him, to honor his government, to honor what he tells us to do about the Sabbath and keeping the Sabbath holy, to honor these things. That's what we had better do. So then he talks about, I'm going to send you Ezekiel, to a rebellious people, to the house of Israel. We Anglo-Saxon people have always been pretty stubborn. The British people have a great deal of pride, and they have a great, wonderful sense of, of uh, ceremony and, and inaugurating and, and crowning the queen and big ceremonies they could put on. And they were the ideal people in God's mind, no doubt have been, to rule over colonies and other nations around the world like India in that way. Modern Hollywood tries to put them down, but they did an awful lot of good. The people of India were starving. They were filthy. 
They were dying of all kinds of disease. They had the practice of sati. They made widows throw themselves on their husband's funeral pyre and burn themselves alive. The Indian women were supposed to give birth over the sacred cow dung because the manure of the cow, the sacred cow, was such a wonderful place to have a baby. How stupid can you get? That was part of their religion. The British helped them get out of that. These modern political operators, they don't like to admit all the good that was done by that. But God used them, but yet they can be very stubborn. The British and American people, and some of the British are a little bit even more formal and slow to come to the truth than we are in America. We're a little bit more wishy-washy, a little quicker to do certain things, but then once you get them there, they'll hang in more. I, I won't try to prove that to you, but I've had lived over there four years and had friends there a little bit more steady and God knows that about us Israelites. We've tended to be more steady once you get us, but we have this stubbornness to be converted in the first place. We all have our national faults. We all have our personal faults. We've got to forgive one another. We've got to see the big picture that God does, but he says these people are stubborn. So then he goes in chapter three, he says, son of man, eat what I give you in this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. And he says in verse uh, seven here, he says, but the house of Israel will not listen to you because they will not listen to me. For the house of Israel are all impudent and hard hearted. Behold, I have made your face strong against their face and your forehead strong against their foreheads. Well, those of us who are used by God today had better have strong will and thick skin because God is going to persecute us or I'm not God, I mean Satan is and God's going to allow that and we've got to be tough and hang in there no matter what. So God tells him then in verse 11, go to the captives of the children of your people. See, they were already in captivity. He's not telling them there's some uh, captivity that will come alone. It's not happened before. It had already happened. But then he goes ahead later and tells them about a yet future captivity. Get to the captives and say, thus here says the Lord, whether they hear or refuse to hear and so on. So he, he was to be, he said in verse 17, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. And brethren, all the way through here, if you study it, you'll see that God inspired Ezekiel to talk about the house of Israel and, get it, and the house of Judah. Judah, as I've explained, and we all need to understand that Judah was one of 12 tribes. And when they broke away from Israel, or rather Israel actually broke away from them, God let Judah keep Benjamin with them and most of the Levites stayed with them. So they had most of three tribes, but the 10 tribes went off. And they're called in history, the lost 10 tribes of Israel. They weren't lost to God. Read the first chapter of James. He says that the Israelite tribes dwelling here and there, God knew where they were. He knows where they are today. And we've traced that. If any of you brethren are new or you listening in elsewhere, if you don't have it yet, please, for your sake, not my sake, please order the absolutely free booklet, The United States and Great Britain in Bible Prophecy, whatever the name is. We've changed the name about 10 times. You've heard me. I can't even remember the name because we've had so many names for it going way back to Mr. Armstrong's. When I first got it, it was just The United States and Prophecy. But anyway, order that booklet, The United States and Britain in Bible Prophecy. It's free. Study it and prove it. Take time. Look it up. Prove it to yourself. That is absolutely vital to understanding this whole topic. Then he tells them here in chapter 4, Son of man, take a clay tablet, verse 1, lay on it, lay it before you, and portray on it a city, Jerusalem. He says, kind of make a play uh, area here, pre pretending that this, this, this fake city you've made here with sand dunes and tile is Jerusalem lay siege against it, build a siege wall against it, and heap a mound against it, set up camps against it, and place, a, place battering rams against it all around. So this fake city was to be called Jerusalem, a symbol of Jerusalem. Moreover, take for yourself an iron plate and set it as an iron wall between you and the city, and your face shall be against it, and it shall be besieged, and you shall lay a siege against it, 
this will be a sign. Ezekiel, doing this in public, apparently, is making this sort of an artificial city and setting a battering ram against then a siege wall up there and attacking it. That was to be a sign, a sign from God Almighty as to what was to happen to Jerusalem. But it was to be a sign, I'm sorry, to the house of Israel. And that's a major key, too. Often the world get, forgets that. You've always got to go right back to chapter 4 to understand this book. You've got to understand our national identity, and you need to understand that God is setting the scene right here in chapter 4. This attack on this uh, city, artificial city, whatever, make-believe city of Jerusalem was a sign to who? To the Jews? No, to the house of Israel. Let's go on. Lie also on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. So we have our iniquity, and God is showing we're going to be punished for that. And then he said, when you've completed this number of days, then lie, then you need to bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. God knows the identity of them. He calls one of them the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Again, brethren, around the world, the house of Judah is the tribe of Judah. Ancient Israel had 12 tribes. The house of Judah was Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Most of the Levites stayed with the temple. And so most of them ended up in the house of Judah. What happened to the other 10 tribes? They went off with Ephraim and Manasseh, who happened to be our immediate ancestors of the United States and Great Britain. And as most of you know, we in America are mainly descended from Manasseh, and the British descended people are mainly descended from Ephraim, which was to become a great commonwealth of nations, and Manasseh was to become the great single nation at the time of the end, and that whole booklet proves that. So he says then, as you lie on your right side, there you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah, Forty days I have laid on you a day for a year. Here you have one of the places of the Bible indicating that principle in prophecy, a day for a year. In Numbers 14, 34, that same thing is given. Often when he says so many days, in actual prophetic fulfillment, it means so many years. <clears throat> and so this is a sign. <clears throat> then he says in chapter 5, you son of man, take a sharp sword, <coughs> Excuse me, I'll get this. <coughs> take a sharp sword and take it as a barber's razor and pass it over your head and your beard. Then take balances to weigh and divide the hair. You shall burn them with fire. One third in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are finished. So he was to burn that. Then you shall take one-third, one-third of your hair, and strike around it with a sword, and one-third you'll scatter to the wind, and I'll draw out a sword after them. Even some of them were to be killed. You'll also take a number, a small number of them, and bind them in the edge of your garment. And frankly, that clearly indicates, if you had a whole sermonette for this sometime, that this is talking about the true church, a small number of people would be taken to a place of safety and protected. Then take some of them. Some people say, boy, if I can just make it to Petra or wherever the place of safety is. Some of you, like my older sons, used to think it might be Fiji or Hawaii or whatever. We don't know where it'll be. But uh, my son Jim is sitting on the beach in Hawaii. He probably hopes the place of safety is in Hawaii. <laughs> but anyway, wherever it is, it may be Petra, of course, but we don't know that. But they think, if I can just make it to the place of safety, no, you'd better make it into God's kingdom. You might go to the place of safety and get in a wrong attitude and God would cause you to be cast out or foolishly to leave in rebellion, and he would take away his protection from you. Getting to the place of safety is not your goal. Getting into the very family of God should be your goal, to let God guide you, teach you, fashion and mold you, make you like he is. That's what God wants, not just to get you to a place of safety. 
So then he said, take some of them even in the place of safety and throw them into the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire. For from there a fire will go out into what? All the Jews? No, into all the house of Israel. All 12 tribes are going to be affected. And then he tells this, he said, Lord God, this is Jerusalem. What's he talking about? Again, you could forget this. You've got to go back to chapter 4, verse 3. This whole mock war against this sand dune or whatever it was, this will be a sign to the what? To the house of Israel. This city of Jerusalem being attacked was a symbol of what was going to be done to the whole house of Israel. And if you understand that and follow that theme through this whole book, then you can understand the book of Ezekiel. And so he says, thus is Jerusalem. I've set you in the midst of the nations, and you've turned away from my commandments and statutes, which they did. But he's also talking about Israel, the whole house of Israel. Therefore, verse 7, because you have multiplied disobedience more than the nations all around you, brethren, that's what we're doing today. We're having more same-sex marriage in the United States and Britain than they're having in Germany and Italy and all those other countries. We're turning further away from God. And God is predicting this way in advance, and that is what is happening today. You've turned away from me more than all the nations around you. You've not kept my statutes and judgments. He said, I will execute judgments on you in the sight of the nations, and I will do among you, verse 9, what I have never done, and the like of which I never will do again because of all your abominations. Read that again. I'm going to do something I have never done, and I'm never going to do anything like that again. What does that tie in with in the rest of the Bible? Well, it ties in directly with Matthew chapter 24, as most of you older brethren should know. Matthew 24, the Olivet prophecy of Jesus, when he comes up to talking about the great tribulation, he says in verse 21, for then will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. There's never been anything like this before. There never, ever will be again. The same time, God does not have two different times like that. He has one time like that. It's all at the time of the end, the great tribulation. This is what he's talking about clearly back in Ezekiel chapter 5 and verse 9. This is a very key verse. Because of all your abominations. What abominations? Why, the abomination they're writing about right here in the Wall Street Journal. State after state in this so-called land of the free and home of the brave is coming up with men marrying men and women wearing women. And that is an abomination in the sight of Almighty God, the Creator, who made us male and female, who made us to be one flesh, to have children together, to have a family, who gave us the different natures that we have to complement each other, that we are made for each other. But a man is not made to help and cooperate with and be the companion in that way of another man. Man, it's an abomination. It does away with the natural leadership a man ought to have in his family. It does away with the lessons of life that God wants a woman to have. It does away with the strength and love and stability of a family. You'll never have that kind of family. I have my granddaughter here, Jim's daughter, and I think one time I took her, and I'd like to do it again sometime as she gets older, and take her up in my study and show her pictures of her parents as they were younger and her, my family, and then her grandparents, her great-grandparents, and her great-great-grandparents, our family. You couldn't do that if you had a homosexual society because they'd, they would be having artificial insemination after a while. They won't have men and women joining together to have children. They would say, we don't know where you came from. You had some man who was a sperm donor giving his sperms to some woman who was willing to carry this and have, it, have the egg 
and her his sperm was implanted in her and she provided the human incubator so the baby could be born and we don't know who your father was and we don't know who your mother was and we don't know where you came from and you will you don't have anybody anybody on this earth who loved you who saw you come right out of her body and when a man is with his wife as I've been over and over 10 times to see my children born Six times, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, ten grandchildren. <laughs> and you know, you know who your baby is, and you have a special feeling for them the rest of your life. It, 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 it can't be duplicated any other way. You know that. It can't be duplicated any other way. God made us a family. You always remember that. This is my child, and the child can remember daddy and mother took care of me. I can remember my mother looking down on me as a little child and loving me and her smile and taking care of me over and over. I burned my bottom terribly on a gas stove when I was just three or four years old. And somehow it was so vivid, so painful, I remember my mother having to put Vaseline or some kind of whatever they gave her on me over and over again for weeks. My mother loved me. She was so patient, so kind. I'm sorry, Roderick, you really hurt yourself awful. I never sat on that stove again. In fact, I think they got rid of that stove and took her out of the house because I was a little boy staggering around the bathroom and sat right down on the burning gas stove. But no one but a mother would have that kind of patience with a little child. I don't care what the psychologists say. It ain't going to happen. It just is not going to happen. The love that can be in a family, the deep feeling, Satan wants to stamp that out. Satan does not like the human family. The human family ought to be a type of the very family of God. And Satan doesn't like the whole setup. So he's bringing in this perversion of our nature and of the family. So God says, enough. I will do among you what I have never done and the like of which I will never do again because of all your abominations. Therefore, your fathers shall eat their sons in your midst. Yes, that's what it says. Cannibalism. You say, oh, we would never do that. Yes, you would. Most of your brethren might not, but many of you would. And the brethren around here in Charlotte and all over New York and Los Angeles and London and Sydney, Australia, yes, they would. Some of you have never been in Ambassador College, but many of us who were there and heard Dr. Lynn Torrance, who was director of admissions, a very fine man and later a minister, and I've read about it many times beside, but he was a survivor of the Bataan Death March, and he was put on a Japanese prison ship, and he was held in Japanese concentration camps, and he told us, as a minister of God, he saw that happening. After a certain point, the human mind snaps. You think, well, this person's going to die anyway, or sometimes he said they'd wait until they would die, or they'd see they were about dead, then they'd snatch their food away so they'd die more quickly. Then while the flesh was still warm and didn't begin to rot, they'd cut the flesh and eat it. Their whole body was crying out for food, and they didn't know God. They didn't understand God's purpose, so that's what they do. Do you think they won't do it again? That's what they did in the Second World War. While I was going to the Joplin uh, the uh, hotel, the Connor Hotel, and having junior high school or high school dances in the roof garden of the Connor Hotel, having fun as a teenager. Kids my age were dying in Hitler's concentration camps, and people were eating each other over in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. Yes, they were. It will happen again. Fathers shall eat the sons, and sons shall eat their fathers, and I will execute judgments among all of you who remain. I will scatter the winds. So those who live through it, he would be taken into slavery. My eye will not spare, nor will I have any pity. Verse 12, one-third of you shall die of pestilence, disease epidemics, and shall be consumed with famine, horrible lack of food, and one third shall fall by the sword all around you, and I will scatter another third of the winds. So they're going to be taken off into concentration camps and into slavery, as the other scriptures show, and I will draw out a sword after them. They're not all going to live. Many will die in the concentration camps or in the beatings. I used to read books, Mrs. Apartin, remember some of those horrible books I used to read from in church, Hitler's Ovens about the little snowmen and how the Germans would freeze people to death and do this and do that. 
They did that over and over in the Second World War while I was growing up. And yet they were the most educated nation on earth. They, oh, well, we have education. We're modern. No, they had more people proportionally with master's degrees and doctor's degrees just as Hitler came to power than any nation on earth. Modern education is not the answer. He says in verse 14, I'll make you a waste and reproach before all the nations. And, of course, God said, I will teach you lessons and he said, against you, I, eternal, have spoken. Over and over, he shows, I am God. In chapter 6, the word of the Lord came, Son of man, set your face toward the mountains of Israel and prophesy against them. And he shows he's going to bring a sword against you. In verse 3, I will destroy your high places. What are high places? They were places of pagan worship. Do you think all these false churches around here are going to be all standing pretty when Christ comes back? Frankly, no, they're not. They're not going to be around. Christ will shake most of them down or cause them to be destroyed. Then your altars shall be desolate. Your incense shall be broken, and I will cast down your slain. And I will lay the corpses of your children of Israel before your idols, and I will scatter your bones all around your altars. Notice verse 6. And all your dwelling places, the cities shall be laid waste, and the high places shall be desolate. He didn't say were 30 years or 100 years earlier. He says they shall be in a yet future captivity and punishment. But brethren, keep your place here and turn with me, if you would, at this point back to 2 Kings 17. As you turn back to 2 Kings 17, this is the inspired record of what did happen in 721 to 718 B.C., over 100 years earlier, well, no, at this point, over 30 years earlier, when ancient Israel was taken into captivity. Notice what happened. He said, uh, the children of Israel, verse uh, 12, or verse 22, walked in all the sins of Jeroboam until the eternal removed Israel out of his sight. So Israel was carried away from their own land to Assyria as it is at this day. And then he said, uh, I'm going to try to get this. Then the kings of Israel brought people from Babylon. This is verse 24. Cutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharvaim, and placed them, these other people, in the cities of Samaria, that's the cities of Israel, instead of the children of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its cities. And it was so at the beginning that they did not fear the eternal. Therefore, he sent lions among them, and they had to learn the religion of the God of the land. God didn't completely destroy them because he hadn't chosen to call them yet. But there were many thousands of people living in those cities. Do you follow me? The cities were not ultimately destroyed. But here in Ezekiel, it says they will be. They weren't earlier, but they will be destroyed. So if you're taking notes and understand this, you could prove to the doubters this is talking about a yet future captivity on whoever is in modern times the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And we need to understand that distinction and what that means. In all your dwelling places, the city shall be laid waste. That did not happen in 721 B.C., and so he shows it will happen. And then it says in verse 9, Then those of you who escape will remember me among the nations where they're carried captive, because I was crushed for their adulterous heart, and they shall loathe themselves for all the evils which they committed and all their abominations. Well, most of them didn't do that back in ancient Israel. They simply were taken over and moved over to northwestern Europe and the British Isles. They didn't know who they were. We've lost our national identity. But later, when Christ comes, these people around here will have been taken into captivity, and they will then finally come back to Israel, and they will understand. We will be there to help teach them if we make it into God's kingdom. Then they will understand, and they will loathe themselves. They'll say, we will wish we had listened to tomorrow's world program. We will wish we would have listened to Mr. Armstrong when he was alive. We would wish we would have listened to God's true ministers. 
but they have not. Chapter 7, he picks up the, 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 the say it again. He says, verse 2, Son of man, thus says the eternal to the land of Israel, and end, the end has come. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. Then you shall know that I am the eternal. This phrase is mentioned over and over in this book. You shall then know who is God, he says over and over. People don't know that today. Verse 5, Thus says the eternal God, a disaster, a singular disaster, be cold that has come, an end has come, and doom is going to come on the land. And he says in verse 14, they have blown the trumpet and made everyone ready, but no one goes to battle. Why is that going to happen in America a little bit later? I think we can see. We have all these Muslims in the armed forces. Some of them are even killing their leaders occasionally. They won't necessarily be loyal. We have all these different races who sometimes will learn to hate each other. We have these different religions. We'll have these homosexuals in there who will resent the fact that the other soldiers don't like their homosexuality. We will have a confused people who will be so confused as to who they are and who God's purpose is. The trumpet will sound and the army that used to defend us in World War I and World War II, that kind of unified army will no longer exist. The trumpet will sound, and they will not go forth to battle. And he says, verse 19, they will throw their silver in the streets. Their gold will be like refuse. All the wealth we accumulate will be worth nothing then. Their silver and gold will not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. Get that. This is all looking forward to what? The time that's mentioned 30 times in, in the Bible, the day of the Lord, the time of God's supernatural intervention in human affairs leading up to and climaxing in Christ's coming and the beginning of the millennium, the day of the Lord. That's the time he's talking about. He says in verse 26, disaster will come upon disaster and rumor upon rumor. Brethren, once this thing gets going, and I don't think it'll happen that fast this year, but we could happen a small series of things. We could happen, we could see the uh, Israelis attacking Iran, and all of a sudden the nations of the Middle East get together because they don't like Iran and Iran might counterattack Israel and virtually wipe them out, and that might be the wound of Judah, Judah's wound, then it would scare as they had a whole Middle East holocaust, a Middle East inferno, as this one Middle Eastern leader said. He said, if this happens, if Israel attacks Iran, it's going to set off an inferno through the whole Middle East. So then you could have a reaction in Europe being afraid of that system and bring about more quickly the united Europe that's going to come, and one thing after the other, one after the other, disaster upon disaster, rumor upon rumor. Then they will seek a vision from a prophet, but the law will perish from the priest and counsel from the elders. They won't have an answer from God in their churches because they are not obeying God. They're not doing what God said. They will not have God's answers to their prayers. Then in chapter 8, it describes again great visions of God and showing some of the paganism. It was a type of the paganism we had today. And in chapter 9, it describes again, Jerusalem is a type of all Israel. And the Lord tells this man, verse 4, Ezekiel 9, verse 4, go through the midst of the city, the midst of Jerusalem, put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done. We ought to have that attitude, being terribly sorry as we see these horrible things happening. To the others, he said, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pitterly. Utterly slay old and young, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark. If you are those who are turned to God and genuinely repent and sigh and cry for the abominations of Israel, then God will protect you. So, Ezekiel falls on his face and asks God to have mercy, and so on. Then in chapter 10, we find more about the glory of God. Unusual spirit beings described here, cherubim and seraphim. And in chapter 11, then the Spirit of the Lord carried him up, and he saw 
here at the east gate of the Lord's house, men committing great iniquity, and he's describing some of the sun worship practices that our nation gets into at Easter time and other practices of pagan abominations and shows how bad that is. And then, of course, he gets into uh, going on in, in verse... Uh, Verse 14, again the word of the Lord, again your brethren, your relatives, your kinsmen, and all the house of Israel in its entirety. He says, talk to them and get away. They say, get away because the Lord has given this possession to others. Therefore, the Lord says, although I have cast you far off from the Gentiles, although I've scattered them among the nations, yet I will be as a little sanctuary to them and then he says, verse 17, Thus says the Lord, I will gather you from the peoples, assemble you from the countries where you've been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. So he's going to bring them all back in due time. Then he says in verse 19, notice this, brethren, Then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them, and will take the stone heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Finally, God will convert them. Did God convert the Jews when he brought them back to Israel or allowed a few of them to come back, I should say, in 1948? No. No, they break the Sabbath over there all the time. You go down to the beach to Tel Aviv and the thousands of Jews are down there, you know, on the beach, breaking beer and listening to rock music just like the kids in Santa Monica, California. They're not converted. Most of them are secular. This is talking about when Christ comes back, he's going to give them a different heart, all of Israel. And they shall walk in my statutes and keep them and my judgments and do them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. So he's going to finally really convert people. Then in chapter 12, he talks again about more general things. And I'm going to have to skip over some of these uh, chapters that are not as specific to us. And in chapter 13, Chapter 13, brethren, turn there. He talks about the modern ministers or prophets of Israel. Are they all evil? Well, yes, in God's sight, but they're blinded. They don't know what they're doing, and so they're completely blinded and cut off from God. Speak against the prophets of Israel who prophesy out of their own heart. Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own heart and have seen nothing. You have not gone up, verse 5, and to the gaps to build a wall for the house of Israel. We have not, the true ministers wouldn't do this, but the false ministers have not strengthened people to obey God and have his protection, to stand in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is just ahead. These false ministers have not taught people God's way. They've envisioned futility and false divination, saying, thus says the Lord, and the Lord has not sent them. And he says all the way through, of course, they'll often say, a peace, verse, verse uh, uh, 16, that is the prophets of Israel who prophesy concerning Jerusalem, who see visions of peace when there is no peace. Likewise, son of man, set your face against the daughters of my people who prophesy out of their own heart. And of course, they use charms and they uh, are talking about these uh, spiritists and people that use horoscopes and fortune tellers and so on. God has not used them. Then he describes in chapter 14 more of the elders of Israel and how they have turned aside from the true God and are worshiping idols. And chapter 15, the same thing. Chapter 16, if you turn there, he talks here about the covenant he made with Israel and how they have broken that covenant of marriage and turned against God into spiritual harlotry. And he's going to have to punish terribly for that spiritual harlotry. And in chapter 17, he talks about, frankly, something I don't have time to go into, but about how the royal family was transported from Israel over to Ireland and then over to Great Britain. And you read of that, of course, in Mr. Armstrong's booklet, The United States and Britain in Prophecy. In chapter 18, he talks about, Behold, verse 4, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father is the soul of the Son. The soul who sins shall die. So souls can die, and he says each one's going to be responsible for his own sin. You come to chapter 20, and here God warns powerfully 
how ancient Israel turned away from the Sabbath day. And he says in verse uh, 12, Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths, which would include his annual Sabbaths. Do we keep them today? No, not our world, to be a sign between them and me. That's why they don't know God. They don't know the God of creation, and they don't know God's plan, because the holy days picture God's plan that they may know that I am the Eternal who sanctifies them. Yet the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes, and they despised my judgments, and they greatly defiled my Sabbaths. Then I said I would pour out my fury upon them. So then he said he would scatter them among the nations, of course, over in verse 23 and verse 24, because they completely turned away from God. And uh, chapter 21, uh, again, more general, often just local prophecies about certain nations, and chapter 22 as well. Chapter 23, uh, I'd like to, uh, like to show here something that does apply to our modern religion. Chapter 22, verse 25. Chapter 22, verse 25, the conspiracy of the prophets in her midst is like the roaring lion tearing the prey. They've devoured the people. Her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. Do the modern ministers in Britain and America have a deep, profound respect for the Sabbath, for God's holy days, for his law about clean and unclean meats, for his law about marriage, and that marriage is a sacred covenant before your Creator to last until death do you part. It's between a man and a woman only. They profane my law. They have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy, and they have not made a difference between the unclean and the clean, and they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths. Have they deliberately hidden their eyes? A lot of them know about it, but because they're blinded, they just turn against it. They don't want to do what God says. He says in verse 28, her prophets have plastered them with untempered mortar, seeing false visions and div div divining lies, saying, thus says the Lord, when the eternal has not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression, committed robbery. Why are so many people in the United States poor and trodden down? These big corporations have taken advantage of them. The banks have charged undue interest rates. The Democrats are partly right on some of that. The Republicans are partly right on other things. Not any one of them has the complete understanding, but when Christ comes back, it's going to be his government that will be made right, and the poor are going to be helped. They oppress the poor and the stranger. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall, stand for a gap, and make a gap on my behalf in the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found no one, no one was willing to stand up in that way among the peoples of the land. So then he talks more about the spiritual harlotry of Israel. And then I want to go over, brethren, so I don't just have you turn, let's turn on over to chapter, if you would, to chapter 33 at this point, because most of this is about specific things or about the nation of Egypt and the great punishment he was going to bring on Egypt and Assyria. In chapter 33, again the word of the Lord said, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say, When I bring a sword upon the land, and the people take a man of their territory and make him a watchman, when he sees the sword coming, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, his blood will be upon his own head. But if the watchman sees the sword coming, verse 6, and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, then, of course, the watchman is in trouble. That's where we come in. We do understand, and we should warn our people. His blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them from me. We are giving a warning over our television program, our magazines and other literature, and we're going to do it more and more powerfully over the Internet in the name of God. Give our nation a warning 
and all the nations of the world a warning from the true God, and I pray that God will help us make it plain and make it strong. In verse 34, chapter 34, I'm sorry, the word of the Lord came, son of man prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, who are shepherds, but of course ministers. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves and should not the shepherds feed the flock. You take the best, but you don't feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick. We're trying to do that. Most churches don't pay any attention. They just said, let them go to the doctor. They don't even understand that. Certainly it applies spiritually, but it also applies physically. They don't even believe in healing. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd and they became food for the beasts of the field, that is the wild animals as the Gentiles are pictured. And so God says in verse 11, be indeed I will search for my sheep. I will bring them out from the peoples and nations and will bring them into their own land and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel. Verse 13, he says in verse 22, brethren, turn to verse 22. Therefore I will save my flock and they shall no longer be a prey and I will judge between sheep and sheep and I will establish one shepherd over them and he shall feed them my servant David. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. If you'll turn back to the book of Hosea, keep your place here, but if you turn a little bit further on in your Old Testament to the book of Hosea, you will see that the same thing is mentioned here in this book, in the book of Hosea. And uh, I want to turn to there. It's Hosea chapter 3 and beginning in verse 4. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without king or prince, that's when our people were scattered in the Middle East and Europe and going toward the British Isles without king or prince, sacrifice or sacred pillar without ephod or teraphim. Afterward, notice verse 3, Ezekiel chapter 3, verse, this is verse 5 now. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the eternal. Finally, our people will seek the ever-living one, their God, and David, their king, shall, again, he, they shall seek David, their king, and fear the eternal and his goodness. When? In the latter days. In the latter days, King David will be resurrected in the resurrection from the dead, and he will literally be the king over Israel once again. Turning back to chapter 34 now of Ezekiel, verse 23, I will establish one shepherd, my servant David, he shall feed them. I, the eternal, will be their God. And of course, the one speaking was who? As Mr. Uh, uh, Lyons explained, that one was Jesus Christ. He's the one speaking, the rock of Israel. I, Christ, will be their God. God the Father will be up in heaven, but Christ will be their immediate Lord and God and, and do that. And David, my servant David, shall be a prince among them. I, the eternal, have spoken, and I'll make a covenant of peace with them. And then he describes how they'll finally break the yoke in verse 27, when I have broken the hands of the yoke and delivered them from the hand of those who enslaved them. So Christ is going to deliver our people finally from the hands of those who have enslaved them. He's going to finally say, enough and punish our people, and when they're humbled and cry out to him, again he will say, enough, and bring them back from the concentration camps. And he said in verse chapter 36, turn now to chapter 36, verse 24 here, for I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land, talking about all of Israel. In fact, he says up in verse 22, therefore say to the house of Israel, he's talking about the whole house of Israel, I'll bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you. You'll be clean. I'll give you a new heart, a new spirit within you. Did the Jews coming back to Israel in 1948, did they get a new heart and a new spirit? No, they didn't get that. And will take the heart of a stone out of your flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. That's yet future. Then you shall dwell in the land of your fathers. That is, you're going to first brought back to Palestine. 
and then later, as other scriptures indicate, be brought right back here again and be given the temperate parts of the earth. And I will be your God and you shall be my people. I will deliver you from your uncleanness and I will multiply the fruit of your trees so that you will never again bear the reproach of the nations, uh, the reproach of famine among the nations. Verse uh, 31 then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. Not for your sake do I do this. Let it be known to you. Be confounded for your own ways. O house of Israel, all 12 tribes, thus says the Eternal, on the day that I cleanse you from your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities, and the ruins shall be rebuilt. The desolate land that was t shall be tilled instead of lying desolate. So they shall say, notice this, brethren, this does not apply to Israel, that is the little tiny nation of the Jews. So they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden and wasted and desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Actually, it's not like a wonderful uh, paradise in Israel. It's still pretty barren over there. Then, this is the key verse, verse 36, then the nations which are all around you, who's all around Israel today? Syria, Egypt, Jordan, Iran, Iraq, all these Arab nations, okay? Then they shall say that are all around you, that I, the Eternal, have rebuilt the, the ruined places and planted that was desolate. I, the ever-living one, have spoken. I will do it. Are they saying that? Of course not. That is yet future. So God is going to bring our peoples back. He's going to bless them in every way. In chapter 37, he talks about the Valley of Dry Bones and how modern people are going to, of course, uh, come up and they will be given a chance, the whole house of Israel, but is also symbolic of the nation, as some say, that nation is going to come back. I'm sure it's dual. But then he goes on to say in verse 21, Ezekiel 37, 21, thus says the eternal God, surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations and gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. Then I will make them one nation He's talking about, as you see, the previous verses, those who are Jews plus the Israelites. The Jews and Israelites don't know that the same people, the Jews that live us among us, they don't know that we're not just, they just think they're different, like a different nation. We're all the same nation. We're all part of Israel. He's going to make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. One king shall be over them all and they shall no longer be divided again into two kingdoms, and they shall not defile themselves anymore. David, my servant, here it is again, verse 24, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes. His statutes include tithing. His statutes include the holy days. All those things are part of the way of God, and do them. Then they shall dwell in the land that I gave Jacob, and so on. And my servant David, he repeats, shall be their prince forever, and I will make with them a covenant of peace, an everlasting covenant. And of course, that is the same covenant described back in, back in the book of Jeremiah 31, where God talks about writing a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. He's going to put his law in our hearts and minds and inward parts, and the whole world will be full of the knowledge of God. So these are some of the highlights. I'm sorry I've had to hurry even more than I thought I would, but I've tried to cover some of the highlights. If you understand this key of our national identity, you understand the key of the fourth chapter, that Jerusalem was a type of all Israel and so therefore he's talked about what was to happen to all 12 tribes and how he's going to bring back the Jews and the Israelites and make them one nation, one people, which they are again, and one king, David, will be over them under the king of kings, Jesus Christ. Then they will have the new covenant written in their hearts and minds, and then peace will dwell on the earth. So that's the big picture. 
and I hope this has helped you to understand the big picture because these things are going to start to unfold, and in fact, they're beginning to unfold right now before our eyes.